Hey, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to this week's episode of the Sensei Playbook Podcast, marketing strategy for the dealer world, so you can hopefully do less and impact a whole lot more. We have an awesome half hour in store for you, none other than Jonathan Dawson of Cellcology, uh, career dealer influencer, and an overall awesome guy. You are going to be better for tuning into this episode. We can't wait to get started, so let's get started. Welcome to the Sensei Playbook, the ultimate how-to podcast for growing and amplifying your brand within the digital world's three-second landscape. Join Bill Courtright and Chris Snellgrove as they discuss the right tools and strategies for building the best online marketing strategy for your business. Tune in to leading business leaders who share information and impart inspiration on providing smooth customer experience and successfully scaling your venture. This is your chance to achieve rapid growth in the highly competitive online market. Let's get this episode started with your hosts, Bill and Chris. It's been said, marketing and sales today, Jonathan, it's not about the cars we sell, but rather the stories we tell. In that context, brother, what's your story? Well, I appreciate that. And, and, I, and I tell you, I know that it's very common in an interview like this to kind of do the origin story, kind of like a superhero. You know, you always want to know the origin story. So I appreciate the opportunity to share a little bit of my story. Before I do, I want to thank you, of course, for the invitation and, and uh, uh, thank you and Chris for uh, bringing my story to your audience. So a um, couple things I think that are important whenever I'm sharing something, because I'm a teacher at both heart, gifting and calling, I like to try to integrate some lessons into some of the things I learned. So I'm going to share some life lessons that are applicable, I think, in broad strokes. And then, of course, to our core audience, while I try to extrapolate, like, how I went from where I was to kind of where I'm at now. So I think the first thing I want to share is that, that I had mentors early in my life. So a big part of my success story is seeking counsel. You know, the scripture in, in, in the book of Proverbs says that wisdom is found in the multitude of counselors. And so one of the big life lessons that I try to impart anytime I can to people is do not suffer in silence and do not struggle alone. You know, if two men go for a walk, it's better that there's two than one, because if one falls, another person can pick them up. A lot of times when we're trying to drive our journey, when we're trying to figure out how to get to that next level, what we tend to do, and this is a little bit of a stereotype, but it's generally true, especially among men, is we tend to try to be very self-reliant. And I'm going to figure this out, and I'm just going to grind my way into my goals. And I just feel like that's a lot of work. And you said at the very beginning, how can you do more with less? Uh, I'm a huge fan of learning from other people. I think anyone who has gone before you can be a warning or an example to you. And so when you look at other people's lives, almost everybody's life, is an example or a warning of what to do or what not to do. So early in my life, when I was a, a young man, I, I got exposed to mentors. Now, part of that was bir uh, birthed out of a need. My father and I didn't have a good relationship growing up. We're, we're we're, our relationship is restored today. But early in my childhood, my dad worked three jobs. And, you know, he was doing what, as a father and as a provider, I think is essential. Take care of your family. But as a young boy, I didn't understand. I had no context for that. All I knew was my dad was tired, had no energy, and was grumpy. And so as a young man, I, I grew up without that real connection to my father and actually developed a resentment to him. And not only that, but a resentment to work. Like I saw him always exhausted because he worked so much. So I grew up thinking, I, I got to figure out how to not be my dad. And so one of the things that drove me in towards entrepreneurship was seeing what I considered at the time what I didn't want to be and figuring out how do I get away from that? How do I get away from kind of a slave to that? So these were early shapers in my psychology, early shapers in the way I approached the world. When I was a young man, uh, 13 years old, one of our neighbors who owned a business, um, it was like a construction company, he hired me for a summer job. And in that summer job, what he was doing was resetting foundations. So he jack up a house, reestablish the framework, and then re-pour you know, cement you know, for, the, for, the, for the foundation. And I, my job was to be under the house, because I was, you know, a young boy, under the house, pulling the cement through the troughs to kind of, you know, get it set up, set, situated. Well, I'm underneath the house, and this is one of my early memories of entrepreneurship drive, un under the house, covered in mud, spider webs everywhere, smelly, stinky, gross. And I look out from underneath the house, and I see my neighbor who owns the company, and he's got a clipboard in his hand, and he points at a clipboard, and points at one of the people, and they run off. And then another person runs up to him, and he points at the clipboard, points at something, and they run off. And I remember thinking, 
no, 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 this is not, that's the gig. Like the, the <laughs> point at the clipboard, that's the gig. Like, that's what I want to do. So really my first day on the job, I told my neighbor, I will keep working for you this summer, but under one condition on the drive in, because he was my neighbor, he took me and on the drive home, any day I work, you have to teach me how to become a business person. And that was at 13 years old. So from that point forward, I've always had mentors. I've always had people that I want to model. I think success leaves clues. And so that drove a lot of my decision-making. It drove a lot of my um, ability to avoid traps, pitfalls, and unnecessary pain um, in my life. So that's a little bit of my backstory there. When I got the uh, 17, I had one of my mentors was an elder of my church, and he recruited me into sales. So at 17 years old, the elder of my church comes to me. And by the way, disclaimer, just pause for a second, disclaimer. When if somebody starts a sentence the way he did, usually you should run away. Okay. Usually. He walked up to me at church one day and he said, John, I've had a vision from God. Hmm. Usually that's a sign that this is about to go <laughs> weird. He said, and some of you, again, you, you, you gentlemen are old enough to probably appreciate this reference point. Some of your audience may not have any context for what I'm about to say, but he said, John, one day every home in America will have digital programming. I said, what? Now, Leon owned a, a like a radio shack in a strip mall, and he had just got the licensing rights to a new technology called Dish Network, offering digital programming over the television. Well, this is new technology back then. DVD players were new technology. Digital TVs were new technology. So this is a while ago. And uh, he comes to me, he says, John, one day every home in America will have digital programming. I'm like, well, okay, I don't know what that means. He says, um, he says, John, one day every home in America, you know what a DVD player is, right? I said, yeah. He said, one day every home will have a DVD player. I said, not possible. They're like 500 bucks a piece. There's no way. And uh, he's like, no, one day it'll happen. He says, I have Dish Network, and now we can offer 40 channels, and, and um, uh, 13 are going to be digital, and 27 are going to be analog. And I'm listening to this man. I have no idea what he's talking about. And I said, Leon, 40 channels. You can only watch one at a time. Who needs 40 channels? I don't even understand what you're saying. And he says, look, every time you switch somebody to this network, I'll pay you $125. And if they do this add-on, I'll pay you $200. And I said, Leon, that's your opener next time, brother. Don't bury the lead, brother. <laughs> should open with that. I'm sold. What do I do next? <laughs> so I got into door-to-door -door sales at 17 years old um, during kind of my free time. I went into communities in Arkansas, knocking on trailer parks, convincing people that they should get uh, Dish Network and switch from Antenna and other uh, programs. That's how I started. Now, I became and I was the number one salesperson in the entire company. I mean, right away. Now, I was the only salesperson in the company. <laughs> but I also was the worst salesman in the entire company. I don't know how many people can claim that they held both titles simultaneously. I was both the number one and the worst salesperson in the entire company. Uh, but uh, as I was uh, as I was uh, knocking on doors, we hired another rep and they said, you know, hey, show them the ropes and I hired another one, show them ropes. And eventually we had like 60 something reps across several states. And I was still the number one salesperson in the company. So I became a trainer of the sales team. And at 18 years old, I'm training all these people way older than me, how to do door to door sales. And sometimes people say, John, how do you learn so fast? Like, how did you adapt so fast? How did you, how did you build your model so fast? Well, it goes back to another piece of wisdom from a different mentor, a, a gentleman by the name of Bud Avans. Um, Bud was a local millionaire in our town. He was an entrepreneur. He was an elder from, from another church, but he also mentored me. And Bud taught me this one simple truth that's a principle that transformed my entire life. I can credit so much of my success to this one wisdom piece given to me by a mentor. Uh, Bud said to me, John, one day you'll build something great, but on the way to building it, uh, work on the principle of in and on. The principle of in and on will accelerate what you build. Now, I'm, you know, at the time, like 17 or whatever, 16 years old, he's telling me this. And I'm like, OK. And he says, do you know what I mean? Not really. He's like, whenever you have something, whatever it is, it's your marriage, it's your job. If it's important, if it's being a parent, you'll always have the ability to work in that thing. Most people will spend that's what they'll spend their time and energy doing, working in that thing. Working on that thing is what will accelerate your ability to grow and get the results you want. So whatever you do, work in it, but work on it. Now, I thought I understood what he meant, but I still didn't. Now, I'm going to put you in the position I was, which is the position of a student. I'm going to put it out there to you. And you may get it at the first guess, but it's okay if you don't. Give me as an example, uh, Bill, and I'll put you, Chris, on the spot too. I'm a salesperson, and you're telling me the principle of in and on. 
What is an example of working in the car business as a sales profession? Give me an example. What, what's what's in the business stuff? Bill, you go first. Uh, greetings, taking ups, prospecting, working your leads, uh, keeping your um, book of business in order. There you go. Um, Chris, go next, something. what comes to mind when you hear a salesperson should work in the business? What does that mean? Connect, connecting a test drive, going over features and benefits. Yep, stuff like that. Now, if I say, but he should also work on the business, what do you think that means? Really, um, your strategy for how you're going to expand your network, um, how, how you're going to expand your your brand in the in the com local community. Um, you know, um, you know, working on the business is is more strategic um, and more important than working in it. Um, so, so I'll let Bill answer next. But Bill, when you heard work on the business, if you're a salesperson, hey, you should work on your business. What did you think that meant? The first, the first thing that popped into my mind was Psychology of Selling by Brian Tracy. Okay, give me an example of that. What do you mean? Well, it was, it was the, the first book I was given as a young sales professional uh, by someone that thought I had what it took to be great. And they said, you're not going to learn what you need to learn here. You need to, you need to read this. You need, to, you need to find the people. You need to stand on the shoulders of giants. Success leaves clues and behaviors are not copywritten. That's right. So, so are, are you implying that like training and, and training your mind is part of working on the business? I would say so. Deep work, baby. Yeah. So I thought that kind of stuff too, but that's not what he meant. Oh, boy. So, wow. Here we go. That's okay. So I, Clean I, out our ears. yeah, so here's where he went. And this is where it, it added a layer that, like I said, has changed me. Most people, when they think of working in the business, they think of the daily tasks. And then some people will label on the business. Like sometimes I'll hear people say like the prospecting, the training, you know, those kinds of things just kind of on the business. But that actually should still be part of the business. Like you shouldn't be in your business and not train or in your business and not prospecting. So prospecting and training is still in the business activities. Uh, growing your mind is in the business activities. Uh, working on strategy, you shouldn't not have strategy. Strategy is in the business still. The on the business nuance that he gave me is on the business is whatever you do to make whatever you're doing a better way of doing what you're doing. So for example, mm. if I said, I'm gonna listen to or read a book. So let's say you and I say, we're gonna read a book to work on the business. That's not on the business, that's in the business still. Working on the business is asking this question, how do I read this book better than I normally read a book? Mm. Having okay. strategy is still in the business. You shouldn't be a business without strategy. On the business is asking the question, how do I build a better strategy than the way I'm building this strategy? How do I communicate my strategy better than I would? So like, for example, if somebody's going through my modules, let's say they're a subscriber to my online university. And so they have access to my portal and they get a video. You could have, let's say three of us all have the exact same resource. We all have the same video module. We're sitting at three stations. We're all watching it. We're all experiencing training in the form of receiving a video. Or for example, this particular series, let's say right now on the planet, somebody who's watching this that there is three other people watching it at the same time, but they may not be watching it in the same way, which is to say how effectively they're watching it. So for example, if you're watching this series right now and you don't have anything to take active notes with and someone else does, let's say for example, you, you don't have a notepad, but someone else has a notepad. Someone else is taking notes, but you're not. You're both experiencing the same opportunity, but you're not experiencing it at the same level of effectiveness. Now watch this. Let's say that next to the person who has a notepad is another person who has a notepad too. They're also taking notes, but they're not taking notes in a notepad. They're taking notes in a notepad designated specifically for training purposes and educational purposes. Somebody might take a scrap piece of paper and write notes on it, but that's different than taking notes in a binder dedicated specifically for growth strategies and note taking. And so at each of these stages, and we could micro parse them out like five more times, at each stage, let's say, for example, there's a fourth person also taking notes. They also have a dedicated notebook, but they don't just have a pen. They have a pen and they have a highlighter and they have a different colored pen as well. And while they're taking notes, they have a strategy for how they take notes that when they get to critical points that they want to store, they take it in a different colored pen and they highlight and they fold the page over. So it's experientially, they all have the same resource. They're all working in the business in the fact that they're sitting here watching this podcast or listening to one of my content pieces. But how they work on it is a different question. It's how do I do what I'm doing better? And so as a young man at 16, 17 years old, being given this wisdom from Bud, I applied it in my door-to-door -door sales that accelerated my ability because I didn't just knock on doors. 
I journaled what I did. And then I asked the question, how do I do that better? Wow. And that transferred then when I got in the car business at 22 and eventually then in what I do now. So that's a little bit of my backstory. And those are a couple of lessons that helped me. So you were, you were doing self-evaluation along the way to get better. You were yes. evaluating your performance and then asking yourself, how can I get better? Yes. Yeah, so, cause it wasn't just to evaluate. Cause a lot of people they'll go like, for example, they'll have a sales experience, whether it's good or bad. Most of the time we only focus on the bad ones. We don't really sit down and go, how do I replicate the good one? Right. But again, so if success leaves clues, if you're going to study anything, you should study the, the good deals more than you even study the bad ones. But what we tend to do, cause our brain does this is we have a terrible experience. We replay that experience over and over and over and over and over again. Well, what should I have done? And all this stuff. Really, you should be replaying the ones that were work that worked right. But what I did is I didn't just evaluate. I, I got a rec- I went, how do I how do I evaluate better? Well, instead of me taking my recollection of what I think happened, what I should probably do is go buy a micro recorder. And then I should actually record what happened. So I have a legitimate actual record of what happened, not my version in my head, but based on my memories and emotions. But what actually did I say? What actually did they say? Then using that recorder and my Sony Walkman headset, uh, I could play it as I was going to the next house and listen to the way I tonality, delivery, questions, rebuttals, and go, okay, what did I like there? Journal it, then refine it and apply it. So it's not just, did I self-evaluate? It's, did I get better at self-evaluating? So when did you first uh, get into the automotive industry? 22 years old in a small town of Emporia, Kansas, uh, a dealership that's now been bought since, but uh, was called Emporia Motors, a Toyota Dodge Chrysler Plymouth and Jeep store. Uh, I was the the new guy. Uh, it's kind of a funny story. On my first day, I heard the expression, which I didn't know what it meant, obviously, because it's not it's car lingo. But one of the guys said, it looks like we're flooding the floor. I thought there was a water pipe leak. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh, wow, there's water leak somewhere. Uh, so, yeah, no, I was the brand new guy. Most of the salespeople had been there for a really long time. I think the, the youngest employee was like five years at the same store. Everyone else was like eight years and 10 years. And the, there was a guy salesman of the year for 13 years in a row when I started. And in two years, um, just under two years, I dethroned him, uh, a guy who just moved to the town, didn't know a soul, and took a guy who'd been at the same store for 18 years and salesman of the year for 13 of them and dethrone them. And uh, (laughs) my managers watched me do it. And this is one of my great joys of my testimony. Um, When I left that store, this is to to give you an idea of how I did it. When I left that store, the owner who hired me and gave me that job, when he discovered that I had started my training company, asked if I could come back and train them on how I did it. That's cool. So imagine being taught the road to the sale by your manager, being shown the steps of the sale and and working alongside your salespeople and doing business the right way in such a way that your own coworkers who watched you outsell them said to the owner, could we have Dawson come back and teach us? We didn't pay attention enough when we, when we saw him do it in real life. So that's That's one of my great, great honors. That's all. Did did y'all, did y'all also seed the lot? You know what that is? We can just see the lot. Sprinkling pennies. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. To activate the car guys. Yeah, the, the, and then and the new guys were picking them up, and the old guys were like, "What are you doing? Leave those pennies alone!" <laughs> Our sacrifices to the gar gods. Yeah, so back in the day. Yeah, for sure. That's awesome. That's awesome. That is great. The path to mastery: learn, do, teach, and you uh, you have lived it, my man. That is amazing. So, what about um, what was your first foray into training? Like, how did you move from sales into the training? Uh, well, so as I briefly mentioned, as a door-to-door salesperson, I kind of became the trainer by default when our store was, when our company was starting, because like I, I was, you know, first sales rep, and then we hired another guy, and I had more experience. So by default, they're like, "Hey, can you show them?" But gradually, because I, because of the way my brain worked, and because of what I taught myself to think about, um, I was transferring the skills. Because my personality, obviously, at 17 years old, was very different from a 34-year-old person or a 44-year-old person. Um, so what I realized right away was that I cannot transfer me. That's unfair to try to say, hey, be like me. In fact, and this is another one of the things that kind of separates me a little bit in the market of, of, of people in my space, is my company is called Cellcology. If you think about all the trainers in the training space, most, if not all of them, are named, their training company is named after the personality who started it. The person who started it, their company is called after them. 
this is not a slight against them. It's just a decision I made. I didn't want it to be Dawson training because I don't want it to be about me. I want it to be about the principles that make it work that can transfer to another person. So I want to honor the integrity and the uniqueness of the person that I'm tra tra training or teaching. I don't want them to feel like unless I become Dawson, I can't do what Dawson said or showed. So that's where psychology is born out of principles and patterns in psychology rather than in my personality um, or my quote process. So, but as this door to door salesman, I became a trainer when I got in the car business. Um, my wife graduated, got her master's, we relocated. There was another training company that I had um, that I had seen that I liked. They actually recruited me and I became a door-to-door -door sales trainer, selling training to dealerships to come to um, offsite events and seminars. And I did that for two years uh, under, uh, under a different umbrella. But in that period of time, and again, this is not me boasting or bragging, it's just stating facts. The guy who had been, uh, who was my trainer to teach me how to do it, had been doing it for like three years. Uh, my second event, I crushed his record. By my by my by sixth event, I did what would be ref uh, four four and a half five times his record by my wow. sixth event. So they did sales and training, uh, sales events and training. Yeah, so they did. They, yeah, they were a training company. They did mostly sales seminar type events where you would go okay. you know, go to a hotel and you know razzmatazz for two days. And I was selling the tickets, right? I was knocking on dealers' doors, getting dealers that, to, to sign up. Can you for tell me. us what? Can you tell us what trainer or what company that was? I, I'd rather I'd rather leave. He's he's. I, I think he's since retired. Um, okay. Okay. So I I just leave it alone because of that. But um, anyways, but that's how I kind of got started as I got recruited, and then because of my background in door to door sales and because of my background in training, it, it evolved very quickly to where I was like started training. And then psychology as a methodology, as a formal methodology, came really out of the fact that that I was working with some of this other trainer's pre-existing clients, right? He's like, hey, go work with these people. And I was literally teaching out of his workbook. So he had a workbook. He had worked with that auto group for a while. They had the same workbook over years. I come in, I'm literally teaching the exact workbook. But the owner and the general manager took me to lunch and said, when did you guys come up with all new material? I'm like, all new material? I'm literally using the workbook that comes from the, what are you talking about? Well, it turned out that my methodology of explaining things was so distinctively different that the end user, the dealer and the salespeople thought it was all new. And I was like, I don't think it's new. It's just maybe explained in a new way because up until then, most training was word track based and script based and steps based. Yep. Yep. It wasn't psychology based. There wasn't a fundamental principle being taught. There was a technique being taught. And that was the distinction that, that apparently the dealers were like, my guys, love, your, our team loves the way you explain things. And is that when psychology was born? I mean, yeah, basically, the, of... the name actually came from a, from, from a dream. Um, I came up with a name in a dream. Um, a dealer was at a 20 group. And prior to that, my company had a different name. It was called Plan B Consulting. And my tagline was, when whatever you're doing doesn't work, it's time for Plan B. Yeah. The tagline, I thought. Anyways, I was at an event, a 20 group, and a dealer was trying to explain to another dealer, that, you know, this prospect dealer. He's like, so what do you do? And I said, well, he's my client. He'll tell you. And the dealer's like, well, it's hard to explain because it's not really training. It's not actual. It's not like what you think of training is. It's, it's, it's psychology. It's sales. It's, it's, it's human behavior. It's sales and psychology. It's much more like selling and psychology than it is really training. I woke up that night in the hotel. Ooh, psychology. <laughs> domain and bought everything and that's where it was born love that's it. cool absolutely love that's it. cool well so uh, oh go ahead chris sorry well I, I just had a question about psychology so you know in, in in the bio you talk about providing a truly unique experience for the consumer mm -hmm. uh when, when when in your training can you kind of unpack that a little bit because you know we we preach customer experience um you know part of reputation sensei's whole philosophy is if you don't take care of the customer, somebody else will, and that's your competition. So the first yeah. thing we do when we go into a store is really focus on the customer experience before we even talk about reviews and, and yeah. generating reviews. Um, so can you unpack that a little? Yeah, I'd love to. So the very first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to start with the end in mind. I think it's really important whenever you're trying to approach solving anything or re, you know, defining something or changing a process or an approach, is to start by trying to get a, a really clear vision of, of what the end result you aim for, hope for, desire would be. 
So the first thing I do is I start with a, a word that is not a common word in our, in our vocabulary. And I would ask anybody watching this right now that if you did nothing else but wrote down this one word and meditated on it day and night, you would see a transformation in your customer experience. And it's the word advocate. So my goal is to teach sales teams how to out-experience their competition and create raving fan advocates. Now, the word advocate is a word we probably understand in general parlance. We know the, we, know, we kind of know the word, but it's really a, a phenomenon in psychology because when you advocate for something, you want it to win. When you advocate for something, you'll defend it. You'll, 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 you'll go march in the streets for it, right? You'll put up you know, you'll put up yard signs for the politician you're advocating for, for the for the proposition you care about. You'll knock on your neighbor's doors. You're willing to polarize half your neighborhood by saying, I'll vote for this person, right? When you advocate for something, you'll take on personal risk or injury in order to see it win. What I find fascinating is that the part of the human brain that would advocate for something, and we as an industry in general, do not even aim for advocacy. We aim for satisfaction. We have customer satisfaction indicators. We we look for, does is the customer satisfied that we didn't screw it up bad enough, right? It's like, no, no, no. What's the goal? The goal is to cause a customer to want us to win in the marketplace. And here's kind of a couple of tests that I tell sales team. These are thought experiments. Imagine for a moment that you um, called 20 of your last customers who bought a car from you. And here's what you said. You said, hey, Joe, um, listen, I just had some yard signs made up, and they say the shiny new car in my driveway came from John Dawson at Dawson Motors. Would you come back to the dealership, Joe? Would you pick up one of my yard signs? Would you put it next to your driveway? Would you take a picture of it and post it on your social media so your entire neighborhood and your network will know who you bought your car from, Joe? Would you come back to the store and get one of my yard signs? The question I have is this. If you called all 20 of your customers, how many of your customers would say absolutely and come pick one up? Most salespeople honestly will say, John, I, I don't even feel like anyone would, or maybe one or two. And that to me is sad because we should be creating the kind of experience that would cause someone to want everyone they know to be our customer too. An advocate will put a tattoo on their body, right? An advocate, like you, you care about something you'll advocate for, you'll ink your body. You'll get in fights on Facebook. Right. Like I tell sales teams, I say, what I want is your customer to get on a fight in Facebook because they saw someone in their network is looking to shop for a car somewhere other than you. And your customers like uh, I'm telling you, just go see you know, Chris at Chris Motors. Trust me. And the, the, the other person's like, well, I'm going to shop around. No, you shouldn't shop around. Go to Chris. And they're like, well, I just want to get a good deal. Listen, mom, if you shop anywhere else, I'm going to block you. Right? Like, all I want is your customers to block their mother. Like I don't think I'm being unreasonable. <laughs> That is That's so true great. advocacy right there. That's true yeah. advocacy. So my point is, broadly speaking, is like I want people to care if we win. So, so the customer experience starts with the end in mind, the concept of advocacy. Now, here's what's fascinating. Advocacy can be created and generated. There is an actual scientific and systematic way to increase the customer's advocacy towards you. But it requires a understanding of psychology that the average sales team doesn't even know exists, let alone how to implement. So when I use these examples, and can I actually, is it okay? I know we're, 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 we're kind of on this a little bit here. Can I actually take a second and show you visually a little bit of what I mean? Can I show you guys something real quick? Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. yeah I just want to show you because I say these things. And sometimes when I say these things, people think I'm just nuts. If they've never studied psychology, if they have no idea what I'm talking about, they're like, this guy's crazy. You know, he's, he lives in crazy town. Like, where's he coming up with these ideas? So let me, um, give me two seconds here. Let me, let me transfer this, uh, this here. So I'm going to do a share screen. Tell me if you guys can see this real quick on the share screen here. Can you guys see that? Yes, we can. So salespeople with their own yard signs, right? So this is what I'm talking about. Do you see that? Yes. Yeah, so these are my actual students, right? Now, what's fascinating is you see like the, the one in the top left there, it says a friend of mine just sent me this one year later, he still has it in his yard. This is in Michigan, right? Oh so this my. customer mows around and shovels snow around a car salesman's yard sign so his neighbors know who his salesman is. And oh then my. you see the green circle below that, it says, wait, what, I must have one. That's the lady on the far right in the yellow. She saw the post and went, wait, I don't have one of your yard signs, drove back to the dealership to get a salesperson's yard sign, right? Now, I have salespeople with their own life-size cutouts. So you can see this one here on the left. 
right? Somebody asked, like, how does a salesperson like this go for, in a town of 12,000? How did he go from 20 cars to 66 cars a year and a half later? How did he triple his business from being the top salesman at 20 to being, you know, 60 cars and self-generating all that business? The way he did it is by creating raving fan advocates. You look at this example here on the far right. That's a family that took his cardboard cutout on vacation. <laughs> that's not normal. That's no, no the, that's the, not, one that's the, the one in the bottom middle is a customer who said, hey, man, I'm buying this truck for my trailer, uh, my camper. We, when we go camping, we we uh, there's a bunch of us to sit around the campfire and talk about our trucks and our gear. Um, you should come hang out with us. He said, actually, you know what? I'll just take your cardboard cutout with me when I go camping. The one in the <laughs> top middle, listen to this. It gets worse. It's weirder. The one in the top middle is a customer taking it on a road trip. It, it went from Wilmington, Ohio to Kalamazoo, Michigan on a road That's trip. Incredible. Here's why. Because the previous salesman I just featured, the, the caring car guy, Jay in Michigan, he has a cardboard cutout too. Clinton wow. and Jay, both my students, thought it'd be hilarious if their cardboard cutouts met each other. Oh my. So Clinton posts on social and says, hey, who will take my cardboard cutout to Michigan for me? And several of his customers said, I have a friend who will take it from here to here. I'll take it from here to here. I'll take it from here to here. Now, they also have their own community events, again, funded by their customers, tens of thousands of dollars raised, and they get tons of referrals. Look at these pages of referral leads that these students of mine get. These are all given at the time of sale. That's 142 referrals. That's 163. That's 297 referrals given at the time of sale to a car salesperson. And what I'm showing you is that this is what happens when you activate advocacy. See, advocacy is a completely different psychological phenomenon than a satisfied customer. So when you ask me, what do you mean by you know, uh, customer experience? I mean, create the kind of wow that causes somebody to say, man, I want your yard sign. I want everyone in my phone book to know who you are because you're the only one I want my people to buy from. That's what I mean by experience. Well, they say the best car salesmen don't try to sell that person that walk on the lot of car. They try to sell everyone that they know a, a car, right? I mean, that's mm -hmm. the that's the whole idea. Wow, that's exactly uh, right. And, and I loved I loved the way the guy branded himself, the honest car guy. <laughs> that's yes, brilliant. Well, but his branding actually came out of his story. He went to federal prison for embezzlement. Wow. He got a job at that dealership as a porter because that was the only job he could get coming out of federal prison. He while he was in prison, he gave his life to the Lord. His life was transformed. He was one of those prison testimonies. And he swore a self, an oath to himself and God that, God, from this day forward, I'll live a life of honesty. Even if it costs me, I'll do what's right. I'll never serve myself through deception again. And so when he built his brand, The Honest Car Guy, he openly shares his testimony with his customers of where it came from. It came from a place wow. of living in deception and, uh, and wanting to live in freedom of truth. That's cool. What a that cool story. is amazing. I love <laughs> that. I love that. Wow. 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 Uh, Chris. You, do you have any last, last, uh, I mean, this was, I, all I got to tell you is I am so much better for having heard your, uh, information, inspiration and influence. Just amazing. So first I'd like to know who is, who inspires you and, 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 um, who's your mentors? Like, what are you reading? Um, like what, do, who do you look for, for inspiration, Jonathan? Well, so one of the biggest voices that's influenced me kind of throughout the years and still to this day does is a voice many of you may be familiar with, the voice of Tony Robbins. So as an active influence, Tony Robbins has been instrumental in mindset stuff. Um, as a teacher and instructor, it's actually a Christian apologist by the name of William Lane Craig. Uh, William Lane Craig is a Christian apologist. He goes to universities and he debates um, for the existence of God, for the claims and, uh, and the validity of Christianity. But what I love about William that inspires me as a presenter of information is there's a humility baked into his confidence that I hope and aspire to demonstrate as well. Because there's a certain thing when you kind of know something. I've been in 3,000 dealerships, seven countries and three continents. I'm a 23-time NADA speaker. Right? These are things that could make me feel very proud. These are things that could make me feel like I know what I'm doing. And when I'm in front of a salesperson who's asking me a question and, and maybe even sometimes challenging me, there is the tendency within my flesh and my nature to be like, dude, shut up and sit down. Like, what the hell are you talking about? Like, you know, do you know who you're asking? Like, I don't not have that within me. I'm aware that that exists because my pride exists. But there's a humility and empathy and grace that when you're teaching people that you must possess because the goal is to know where you're trying to take them better than where they know. 
Like managers will often say to me, John, what do you do when you have a person on your team and you want it for them more than they want it for themselves? And I say, well, the moment you stop wanting it more than they want it is the moment you should resign as their leader. Like the leader should know where you're trying to take people and should see the promised land. If I'm trying to lead you to the promised land, I need to know that it flows with milk and honey. I need to know that there's a promise there worth fighting through this desert for. And so when you're trying to lead somebody, you need to have more conviction than they do. But you need to lead with compassion because they're not where you are. They haven't seen what you've seen. And so I love uh, Tony Robbins for Mindset. I love William Lane Craig for teaching. Um, I'm, I'm actually uh, going to Patrick Bet David's um, uh, sales executive summit here happening in, in a month and a half. Um, he's a person who I, I, I appreciate the way he communicates. And uh, so he's another person that I, I enjoy listening to and, and reading. Um, so those are just a couple names off the top. Cool. And um, also, uh, I'd like to know, um, you know, two questions. Yeah. What, what do you want to be known for? My number one would be that he loved Jesus, that he served people out of compassion and out of calling, that I protected my testimony, that I never brought shame to my wife or to my clients or to the Lord. Um, I would want to be known for that first. Um, I'm looking forward to hopefully one day hearing good and faithful servant enter into my rest. It's my highest priority. Now, I've been gifted uh, with a certain thing that the marketplace seems, at least for now, to enjoy and get value from. So I want to be known also in the marketplace as somebody who brings a lot of value, um, somebody who's committed to saving the world one salesperson at a time, which is my mission statement. Uh, I want to be known for that. Um, I, mean, I also I really love the fact that many of my clients, they say, look, of all the things I can say about psychology, the number one thing I can say is it's effective. It affects change. It, it, the, the, the teams that, the, that deploy it and apply it, they get transformative change. And yeah. you, you, you know, people's lives are different because of what psychology brought into their life. I would love to be known for that. And that's a high priority as well. Well, I think uh, you're accomplishing it. I was talking to Damien Boudreaux, a good friend of mine the other day, and mm -hmm. he could not say enough kind things about you. He said you're well. just absolutely crushing it and, and, and changing lives one salesperson at a time. So congratulations, yeah. man. Thank you for that. I, uh, if I can, I'll show you one last thing here just to, to, to kind of um, uh, end on a really strong high note here. Um, here are some of my um, raving fan lunatics. lunatics. <laughs> you know what a lunatic is? <laughs> A lunatic is a customer who will do this. <laughs> oh my gosh. Wow. <laughs> That's a lady. It's her first ever tattoo. And no, she's not the girlfriend. She's just a customer. And then when he posted this, another customer came in a week later and said, dude, I saw your post. I got you too. And then one of my other wow. students in, in, in Kentucky saw Jay's post about this. So my student, Nick, did his own post. He said, hey, Jay creates raving fans like I do, but he's got something I don't have yet. He's got people getting tattoos. Who's going to get the <laughs> human with knit tattoo? And then one of my other students said, four days later, I got my first tattoo. Then I got more tattoos. And That's amazing. Oh, my gosh. I thought you were kidding about the, the when you mentioned tattoos. I was thinking Harley Davidson because people get right. Harley Davidson no, no, exactly. all the time. But that is amazing, brother, wow. brother. Look at the bottom right one there. I'm part of an elite club. The customer says, "Wow." So, so That's yeah, because but to your point, why would somebody get a Harley Davidson tattoo or, or, or a, a Nike tattoo or a UFC tattoo? Why would they do that but not get your tattoo? Sales managers will often say to me when they first see this stuff, they'll say, "John, I, I can't even get my guys." to get a review from a customer and you're getting tattoos. Like I can't get a customer testimonial video, but you're getting freaking tattoos. And I say, yeah. and here's why the difference is this, you're managing to the middle and I'm managing to the outlier. I'm teaching them how to be outliers. You're teaching them how to be average. You're asking for the minimum acceptable thing that you want to tolerate. I'm asking them to be great. I'm, I'm not giving them an aspirational calling and equipping them with the resources, the psychology, the tools, technology, and the understanding to become the kind of person worthy of it. And that's why I sell sales teams. It's not just about getting names and numbers or referrals. It's not just about getting tattoos. It's about becoming the kind of person worthy of it. Are you worthy of a referral? Is your sales team worthy of referrals? Is your sales team worthy of reviews? Become worthy of it. That's what you should aim for. 
That's amazing. That was amazing. That's right. Yeah. Well, listen, Jonathan, on behalf of Chris and myself, the entire team here at Reputation Sensei and Digital Media Nation, we'd like to express our sincere gratitude for the almost 40 minutes that you spent just loving on, consistently loving on every single one of our listeners and viewers. Anybody who bookmarks this episode will be better for it. Uh, I'm going to re- rewatch this episode uh, more than once. Uh, this one was a keeper. I can't thank you enough, sir. You're the best. Well, I appreciate it very much. Thank you, Chris. I'm honored. Thank you so much. Yeah. If anybody wants to find me, if they're not familiar with psychology, I'm all over the web like Spider-Man. You can't miss me if you're looking for me. Just go to Google and type in psychology. That's S-E-L-L-C-H-O-L-O-G-Y. Um, and, uh, or search my name and reach out to us. Um, we've got tons of free resources, um, you know, from audios to videos to articles. And if you like what I give for free, you can only imagine how much you'll love what I charge you for. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Well, we got a couple of evangelists here. <laughs> we'll be, uh, we'll be helping you out every step of the way. Nice Thank you very much. Jonathan. Jonathan. All right. Thank appreciate you. you both. Thanks so much. That's all for this episode of the Sensei Playbook. May these strategies help you build a powerful business roadmap and dominate the online marketplace right now. Be sure not to miss another episode jam-packed with valuable advice from our marketing martial artists, Bill and Chris, by subscribing to the podcast at podcast.reputationsensei.com. Don't forget to share with your friends and fellow entrepreneurs who also aspire for massive business success. Thank you for listening. Until next time.